So this is part four of the molecular uh, structure and bonding unit. And um, so far, remember, we've dealt with Lewis structures. It was a, a model to represent bonding. Uh, we've looked at BSEPR theory, which is a model to give us an idea of what shape and um, molecules can be. And now we're going to look at valence bond theory, which was the first quantum mechanical theory that was developed to describe bonding. And it incorporated the wave functions of an electron pair that are formed by superimposing the wave functions for the separated fragments of the molecule. So what does this mean? It means that we're taking the wave function for um, two of the atoms, bringing them together, and when the wave functions overlap, we add them together. So essentially what happens is that bringing two atoms together is going to give us a molecular potential energy diagram, which is shown on the right-hand side of the slide in um, this diagram here. Just let me indicate it to you. So it's this one here. And as you can see, as we are bringing the two atoms closer together, so the direction of movement is this way, uh, it becomes a critical distance where we can no longer bring the two atoms together anymore before the energy shoots up quite dramatically in that direction. Okay, so the molecular potential energy curve shows the variation of the energy with the internuclear separation. Okay, so let's use hydrogen as an example, where we consider two hydrogen atoms, atom A and atom B, and their wave functions can be described by the two equations over here. So wave function for um, uh, the, the first atom is described by this uh, equation here, and the wave function for the second atom is described by this wave function here. So then we superimpose these two wave functions, and that basically means we make a linear combination of these two to give this superposition equation over here. And this is then described as the valence bond wave function for the HH bond. Okay. Now this wave function is formed by spin pairing of electrons and into the two contributing atomic orbitals. So what we find is we bring the two atoms together. So this will be atom A, as I've said, this will be atom B. Each one has one electron, we bring them together, and the common space that they share, we get these two spin-paired electrons over here. And if we were, had a p orbital, we could put the two electrons into a p orbital. Remember the shape of a p orbital is this dumbbell, this dumbbell type shape that you're seeing over here. I'll, I'll explain the colors later on um, when we do molecular symmetry. Okay, so now let's go a little further. Instead of just looking at hydrogen, let's look a little bit further now to something like nitrogen. Okay, so nitrogen has the following electron configuration. As I underline it here, you will see uh, we have essentially 1s2, 2s2, and now I've separated the p orbitals to show the different directions that we've already taken a look at in unit one. Okay, so we've got one electron in the PZ, one electron in the PY, and one electron in the PX. Okay, so now these can form sigma and pi bonds, which you're familiar with, because we have three p orbitals where one can form the sigma bond and two can form the pi bond. So we know that when we have um, the head-to-head -head overlap like we do uh, over here, okay, so in this case we have a PZ, and we have a PZ, and we have overlap with the spin pairing over here, this we form a sigma bond. Okay, and then if we look at the pi bond formation, we know that in this case, this can be either PX or PY, it doesn't make a difference. Let me just um, make a PX orbital and a PX orbital here. And of course, this sideways overlap here will give us the pi bond. Okay, so. In a sense, this is consistent with the Lewis structure for nitrogen, which we know has nitrogen with a triple bond. So we have the sigma bond and then two pi bonds because this can be 
um, replicated with the PY orbitals, two PY orbitals, just in a different orientation. So the bonding is going to look something like this in this diagram over here, which is rather complex. Um, but this matches the Lewis structure, which we um, think might actually be the correct structure. But as we go along, you'll see how we can develop our bonding theories to accurately explain the um, the bonding in between two homonuclear diatomics. Homonuclear means of uh, same type. Diatomic means two atoms. Okay, now let's go to polyatomics. Polyatomics are where we have more than two. Okay, so we talk about diatomics, and in this case, we talk about polyatomics because now we have three or more. Okay, so for water, we have um, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And if we look at the uh, electron configuration, we know that this is the electron configuration for the hydrogen atom. Um, I'm sorry, this should be 1s1. Okay, and then for oxygen, we know that we've got the helium, which is actually 1s2, and then we've got 2s2, 2p2, and then 2py1, 2px1. We've only got two um, unpaired electrons here and here, which are available for bonding. So we've got two unpaired electrons in the 2p orbitals pair with the elect one electron each of the hydrogen forming a sigma bond. So we can sort of represent it as we see over here, where we've got the one electron from hydrogen here uh, overlapping with one electron from oxygen, and the similarly for the second hydrogen and the second electron of uh, the unpaired electron of, of oxygen. So we're forming sigma bonds here because these are head-to-head -head overlaps, okay? Just as, a, as you know, head-to-head -head overlaps give us sigma bonds. So the 2py and the 2px orbitals are 90 degrees to each other. So this implies that the bond angle is 90 degrees. But we know very different information that the experimental bond angle in water is 104.5 degrees. So what is going on here? Okay, so how do we explain this? And other anomalies that we see that are not just related to water, but they're related to other molecules as well. How do we explain this? Well, we have to use some kind of theory that fits in with valence bond theory to help us understand what is happening. Okay, so what happens is that we get this thing called hybridization. Now, hybridization, as you know from your first year chemistry, is orbital mixing. Okay, so that means that the electrons from an S orbital can be promoted into the uh, empty spaces of the P orbitals so that we have unpaired electrons and we form these mixed orbitals, which we say are hybridized. Okay, so it's basically we get promotion of electrons, we get hypervalence, and we get hybridization. The electrons can be promoted to a higher energy level to form more or stronger bonds with lower energy. Uh, many instances we have octet expansion, and as I said, we have orbital mixing or wave function interference, and this occurs to help us explain the molecular geometry. So, for example, we form sp3 for water. Okay, so we've got one S orbital overlapping with three P orbitals. And if we look at this diagram on the right hand side, this is what an SP3 hybrid orbital looks like. Okay. And of course now we see that we can fit four of them into the molecular geometry which we know is tetrahedral. So if I take another one of these, I can fit it um, along this axis here. And if I take a third one, I can fit it along this axis here. And if I take a fourth one, I can take it on this one here. So how do I know that there are four or orbitals? Well, remember that we don't represent the one over here, but you can assume that there's one uh, electron here and three, uh, sorry, one S orbital and three P orbitals. And this gives us three plus one, which equals four, 
which explains why we get the molecular geometry as tetrahedral. Okay. There we go. And of course, if we're going to do the sort of mathematics, which is visible down here, you can see that we've got uh, wave functions for uh, four different orbitals. So they're represented by H1, H2, H3, and H4, as you see on the bottom left of the slide. And there's a linear combination of these orbitals to give us four hybrid orbitals. OK, obviously, this becomes a whole lot more complex. And so what you've done in first year, you'll remember that for linear um, molecules, you came up with this. SP hybridization, but that doesn't mean that P and D orbitals and even S and D orbitals can overlap to give you two orbitals. So remember, we have an S plus a P that's going to give you two orbitals. And similarly, S and D will give you two orbitals and P and D will give you or two orbitals. Now, in this case, with an S and D, you're going to get a different geometry. OK, it's still got a coordination number of two, OK, which means that um, there are only two orbitals that overlap, but the geometry is going to be different to accommodate the um, electron density. Okay, then you learned in first year about sp2, and you will see now that there are others in terms of combinations of orbitals. So we've got p2d, we've got spd, um, spd, we've got pd2. Okay, so it doesn't mean that those orbitals cannot mix with one another. All right. Now, with tetrahedral, you learned about sp3 hybridization, but there are also others, many others. Um, just indicate a few. sd3, spd2, p3d, pd3, p2d2, and sp2d. Okay. When we come to trigonal bipyramidal geometry, you remember sp3d from first year. But there's many more, as you can see. And then the last one you will remember from first year is octahedral geometry, where you did sp3d2. And you see that there are others as well with indicating the uh, number of orbitals. Remember how you count the number of orbitals? You count there's one s orbital, there are three p orbitals, and there are two d orbitals that overlap that give you a total of six. Three plus two plus one gives you six. So with valence bond theory, it sort of helps to explain the geometry and the type of bonding that exists, but it's not 100% just yet. So you got, we're going to see in the next part um, the, the best way to describe uh, different the bonding between um, atoms. And not only does it take care of the... Uh, the geometry, so we have a mixture of valence bond theory and uh, a few other things, but it explains a lot of the physical properties of the elements as well. And we'll move on to that in the next part.